My dear respected elders, brothers and sisters, from the time that children come into this world, the focus of the parents is that how can this child grow up, get a good education, go to a good college. And the whole purpose behind this type of thinking is that the child's sustenance, the child's risk can be provided for and they can get a good job and a good living. So this focus towards the risk, the sustenance, it starts from this time immediately. The parents start worrying about making a college fund, thinking about which area to move in so that the child has the best schools to go to and so on. The children as they grow up, they are taught the same thing. That make sure you get a good education, make sure you get, go to a good college, make sure you get a degree. The whole purpose behind it is that you will get a good job and you will make money. And then by that time, the, the, the child turns into a teenager. He starts thinking about college with the same thing that has been instilled into him since childhood. That what should my career be? What is the best career in this time which will enable me to make the best money possible? So this teenager starts focusing on that. And then that same teenager goes to college, 
gets that education, finally gets that job, and then as the person grows up, then the same focus on the risk and sustenance accumulation, making sure that the family is provided for, until the person is about to reach retirement age, and the focus is at that time, that how can I accumulate a nice nest egg for myself, so that I can have some money to survive, survive on for the rest of my life after retirement. So we look and we see this whole state of events and it seems like the whole focus on a person's, of a person's life is the accumulation of risk and the sustenance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually has taken the responsibility of providing risk for every single creature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا مِنْ ذَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَوْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا وَيَعْلَمُ مُسْتَقَرَّهَا وَمُسْتَوْدَعَهَا There is no creature on the earth, no creature, whether that creature is big or small, or microscopic that we cannot even see it with our eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken it upon Himself. عَلَى Allah, this عَلَى, it's for نُزُوم. إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken, up, uh, taken it upon Himself to provide the risk for that creature. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows where every single creature resides, where it stays. يَعْلَمُ مُسْتَقَرَّهَا وَمُسْتَوْدَعَهَا And there are so many wonder, wonderful creatures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created that Allah provides sustenance for them. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided sustenance for the baby in the womb. There is a special type of fish. It's called mudfish. And this fish actually, it lives in lakes. And those lakes, they dry out in the summer. So what this fish does, it burrows into the mud of those lakes. The water on top, on the surface, it dries up. But this fish can survive inside this mud for about two years. The question is that who provides the sustenance for that fish during those two years? And then when the rainfall comes again, it comes up into the water again. It emerges into that same lake that had dried up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken the risk, the responsibility for, for providing that sustenance and the risk for every single creature. As humans, we need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing for us. He is the provider. Yes, we adopt the means, we work, we earn a living, and we take all the steps that we can to, pro to get that risk provided for us. But the main thing that we need to be striving for is not just the accumulation of risk. What we need to be striving for is to get barakah in the risk that Allah SWT has provided for us. And this is what today's khutbah is about. How to attain barakah. And this concept of barakah is something that really cannot be translated into English. The word barakah, the best translation you can give is probably blessing. But the concept behind barakah is that Allah SWT enables a person to do with his, with his wealth, with his time, more than other people can do, more than normal. This is basically what barakah is. And to understand that in a clearer way, we look at the scholars that came before us. Those scholars that had no access to computers, they had no access to telephones, they had no access to any type of communication except face-to-face -face communication. Those scholars, they wrote volumes and volumes of books that we find it hard to even read in our lifetime. <coughs> Just imagine Hafiz ibn al-Hajjab, for example, he wrote Fatih al-Bari, which is the explanation of Imam Bukhari's Sahih. And on top of that, he wrote many other books. Another book that he wrote is a book called Al-Isabah. And this book deals with the ilm of Rijal. That means 
It's an index of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and whether they were regarded as thiqa and acceptable in the science of Hadith or not. Every single Sahabi in alphabetical order who has ever narrated a Hadith, his name is found in this book of al isaba And this book is in about 20, 22 volumes. And then on top of that, many other books that were written by Hazrat al Hajar. Imam Nawi, rahimahullah, he died in his 40s. And yet he did so much work and he wrote so many, so many books, again, which we have, we have a hard time reading in our lifetimes. So this was because they had barakah in their time. We have to strive to get barakah. And that barakah, many people equate it with numbers. And this is not necessarily the case. You can have barakah in a small amount and you can have barakah in a large amount. And also you can have an amount which is small which doesn't have barakah and you can have a big amount which doesn't have barakah. So barakah is not correlated with the amount. Rather the khayr that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the goodness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts inside it, this is, you know, what barakah is. How much a person can get out of that money, how much a person can achieve through that wealth. This is what barakah is. So there are a few steps that I'd like to talk about. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, the first step of getting the risk and of course getting barakah in it, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِرُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to a person who has the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He makes a way for him. And He provides him sustenance from where he cannot even imagine. This is what the ayah says. وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِرُ This is part of barakah, that risk comes to him. Sustenance comes to him from where he didn't even know it was going to come. He didn't even make an effort for it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to him. So the way to do that, the way to achieve that, is to get taqwa in one's life. And taqwa is to build an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to act our lives in the accordance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands and to stay away from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is basically taqwa in a nutshell. Many people just translate taqwa as the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is not a correct translation. <coughs> taqwa basically means an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bringing about an awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that compels us to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is Rahim, He is Kareem, He is Rahman, He is doing so much for us. He is providing for us. He is giving us air to breathe. He is giving us water to drink. He is giving us food. Despite our disobediences, despite the fact that we disobey Him night and day, He is not punishing us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who loves us very much, we have to show our obedience to Him. We have to be obedient to Him. We have to stay away from His disobedience. And this is basically what taqwa is about. When a person has the taqwa, this is the first step to getting barakah in one's risk. And of course, part of taqwa is to fulfill the obligations and the faraqib that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put upon us. To pray five times daily, to fast in the month of Ramadan, and to give the zakah, perform the hajj when it's due. This is all part of taqwa. It comes under taqwa. The second means to get barakah in one's life is to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The duas that were related by the Prophet they are very concise and complete. The Prophet himself, he says, about one of the qualities that were given to him specifically. He said, I was given the ability to say sentences which were jami, concise and complete, brief yet complete and all-encompassing. So the du'as that the Prophet ﷺ used to do, they used to cover so many things. Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'ah, wa amalan mutakabbala, wa rizqan wasi'ah, wa shifa'an min kulidat. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yinfa'ah, wa nafsin la tashba'ah, wa qalbin la yakshah, wa dua'a illa yusma'ah. There are so many things covered. Sustenance, 
protection from illness, knowledge, practicing upon the knowledge. All of these things in two very brief sentences. There's a story in which the Prophet ﷺ, in the masjid he saw a Sahabi named Abu Mama. And this was at a time when people were normally not in the masjid. And Abu Umama looked very upset and worried. So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, Ya Abu Umama, ma alladhi ajlasaka fil masjid hadi sa'a? What is the thing that made you sit in the masjid at this hour? So Abu Umama said, Ya Rasulullah, humumun asabatni wa duyunun ghalabatni. I've been overcome with worries and concerns and I've been overburdened with debt. I don't know what to do. I have worries, I have grief, and debt is on my head. I don't know how to pay this debt off. The Prophet ﷺ, he always used to turn people towards a'mal and deeds. What we tend to do, we try to get do everything first and then when there's no option left but to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's when we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always used to turn people towards a'mal and deeds turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says istainu bi sabri wa salam seek the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through sabr through perseverance patience and through salat so the Prophet used to teach this so he said the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam to Abu Umama, shall I not teach you something that if you were to say this, it would get rid of your debts and get rid of your worries and concerns? He said, Bala Ya Rasulullah, of course, tell me. So the Prophet told him, Qul idha asfahta wa amsayt, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan, wal-azi wal-kasl, wal-jubni wal-bukhl, wa a'udhu bika min ghalabat al-dayni wa qahri rijal. Each time, you pray Fajr prayer. After Fajr prayer, you make this dua. After Maghrib prayer, you make this dua. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan wal-a'zi wal-kasl wal-jubni wal-bukhl wa a'udhu bika min ghalabat al-dayni wa qahri al-bijal. Basically, asking Allah SWT to get rid of all worries that a person could have. All problems that a person could have are summarized in this one dua. So making these du'as and making it a habit to have these du'as and practice these du'as, this is a, a source of barakah. Simply saying Bismillah before eating is a source of barakah. When a person says Bismillah, the shaitan that was trying to eat with you, he gets pushed away and he cannot eat. Otherwise, if a person starts eating without saying Bismillah, the shaitan also includes himself in that food. He starts eating. And obviously when the shaitan starts eating, then there is no barakah left in that food. Simply saying Bismillah is enough to get barakah in one's food. So the dua is the second aspect and the second way that we can get barakah in our lives. The third thing is Silatul Arham. What is Silatul Arham? Enjoying good relations. And really it means enjoying good relations with those relatives that do not treat us well. Otherwise, anybody can be good with somebody who's good with them. If my relative is good with me, automatically I will be good with that person. But real silat al arham real enjoying of good relations, is to deal with those relatives that give you a hard time, that give you problems, to deal with them in a good way. The Prophet Ali Sallallahu he said about that person who makes this Silatul Arham that his footsteps will increase. Meaning, his the, the, the work that he can do in the time that he has, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will give barakah. And his life will increase. He will, his life will increase through Silatul Arham. So, like I said, those relatives that are giving us a hard time to be good with them, to deal with them in a good way, this is what Silat al-Arham actually is. So, irrespective of whether those relatives are good with us or not, we need to make sure we are enjoying 
good relationships. And this will result in the barakah in our lives. Finally, we need to understand that working by itself, this is not something that is against tawakkul or against the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, if a person is working with the intention of providing for his family, then and he is not neglecting the fara'id and the obligations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put upon him, and he thinks and understands that it's a responsibility of mine to provide for my family, it's a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide for my family, then this will also become a, a form of worship for him. Many people, they misunderstand a, a very famous hadith. That those people, If you were to have the tawakkul on Allah SWT, as you should have, then you would eat like the birds eat. So the understanding is that the birds, they don't go to work, they don't have any business, yet Allah SWT provides for them. But the reality is, the hadith goes on to say, Those birds, they fly off in the morning to seek their sustenance. They work, they don't just sit in the nest. They go to seek their sustenance and then they come back with a full stomach. So to seek sustenance, to work for a living, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it as long as the the living that a person is earning is halal, a person is not neglecting his fara'id and obligations for it, and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has termed, the risk Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses many words in the Quran for risk and sustenance. Among those words used is the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are sitting here for Jum'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, إِذَا نُوذِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ جُمْعَةِ فَسْعَوْا إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَذَرُ الْبَيْتِ when the adhan is called for Jum'ah, then you have to leave your work, leave your business. After the adhan, anything you do in terms of earning a living is haram, it's not permissible. You have to go to the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to go for the khutbah. But, فَإِذَا قُضِيَةِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Once the salat has been done, then spread out onto the earth and seek. There is a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seek the sustenance. Seek the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And while seeking the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wadkuru Allah kathira. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while doing that. Don't forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What that means is that in the course of earning your living, make sure that what you're doing is halal. You don't cheat. You don't lie. Remember that you have to stand in Allah's front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and he will ask you about what you did, whether you earned this from halal or not. Many people, they also, they differentiate between what happens in the masjid and what happens outside. What happens in is the masjid is the deen, and what happens outside, it's my business. Nobody should tell me what I should do. This is the attitude that the people of Shu'aib had towards him. These people were a businessman and traders. And in the course of their business, they used to cheat people. Shu'aib salam told them, no, this is not right. The remainder that Allah SWT gives to you from your, your earnings, which is halal, it is better for you, if only you knew. But their response was, Ya Shu'aib, Shuaib, what are you talking about? This salat and this worship and all this, that's okay, you do that. But does that also mean that we should leave what our forefathers have been doing? And also does it mean that we should stop doing in our wealth what we want? This, this doesn't seem right. Religion on one side, our life on the other side. This is not what Islam is about. Islam is all encompassing. Islam teaches us how to live our lives from the, from the time we wake up in the morning 
to the time we go to sleep. Everything is covered. Our business, our dealings, how we talk to our wives, how to, we talk to our children, how we deal with our neighbor, whether that neighbor is Muslim or non-Muslim. All of this is taught to us by Islam. And we have to understand that Islam is not limited to what we do in the masjid or at a certain month of the year or at a certain night of the year. But Islam is all of our lives, 365 days a year, morning till evening. What we do is Islam and what we do is either obedience of Allah SWT or disobedience of Allah SWT. And even the most menial things, if done with the right intention, can, be, can become a form of ibadah for us. Even when a person goes to the bathroom, he goes according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, this is an ibadah. A person who eats according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, this is an ibadah. A person he provides for his family, this is the best form of sadaqah according to hadith. As long as the intention is there, in the al-a'mal bin niyat. So I'm running out of time, but the summary basically is that 